welcome back my dear students now in the previous section i told to you about the different antioxidants i am repeating a few antioxidants so that you can emphasize on this these are very important antioxidants antioxidants can be enzymatic or non enzymatic so we were looking at the enzymatic antioxidants out of which the first antioxidant which is enzymatic is superoxide dismutase i was telling in my previous lecture O2 superoxide combines with one more superoxide and protons to form basically hydrogen peroxide plus oxygen. Hydrogen peroxide plus oxygen. These reactions need not be balanced. You need not know them also. So this is the action of superoxide dismutase. And where did you see this? This was happening even in the phycolysosome when when uh, NADPH was being oxidized, oxygen was converted to superoxide. Superoxide was further converted to hydrogen peroxide. So let us look at where is its distribution. It is present in the cell cytoplasm. As I have told to you, the whole cell needs everywhere it needs different uh, antioxidants to prevent it from damage. If you look at the nucleus, the nucleus requires its, its uh, antioxidants. The mitochondria require its antioxidants. The endoplasmic reticulum requires its oxidants. The lysosomes require, the peroxisomes require. Each of these the cell cytoplasm requires. So SOD is mainly in the cytoplasm. Is there anywhere else? Yes, SOD is there distributed both in the mitochondria and in the cytosol. Now in both these there is a slight difference. One is a copper containing enzyme, copper zinc enzyme which is a present in cell cytoplasm and in the mitochondria it is a manganese containing uh, enzyme. It catalyzes the dismutation of superoxide anion. There is also an extracellular form of superoxide dismutase which is present in plasma, lymph and synovial fluid. So we have it outside the cell also. So mitochondria, cell cytoplasm and outside also. This is superoxide dismutase. What is important about this enzyme is that it requires copper or it requires zinc or manganese. Now let us look at the next enzyme, enzymatic antioxidants that is catalase. Now catalase is found principally in peroxisome and to a lesser extent in the cytosol and the microsomal fractions. So its main function A of catalase is in the peroxisomes. The peroxisomes, a few is present in the endoplasmic reticulum or in the cytoplasm. Now what is its main function? In granulomatous cells like uh, maybe macrophages, the enzyme protects the cell against its own respiratory burst. Remember, during the respiratory burst, hydrogen peroxide was formed. So we need a mechanism to protect these cells. This hydrogen peroxide act, is acted upon by catalase and it gets converted to water and oxygen. Again, I have not balanced uh, the reaction. Please don't bother about it. What is important is its action. Catalase acts on hydrogen peroxide and converts it into a non-radical product like water or oxygen. That is important catalase. Now, what else is important? It decomposes hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. Whenever as soon as the action of hydrogen peroxide is over, it is converted to hydrogen uh, water and oxygen. Remember the cell does not know how much of hydrogen peroxide is required to kill a particular thing. So if something extra is produced, we need to have a mechanism to defend it and that is provided by catalase. Now let us look at the next enzymatic antioxidants that is glutathione peroxidase. Glutathione peroxidase, the word peroxidase tells you that it also acts on hydrogen peroxide. Peroxidase means peroxide. Now the, it is present, where is it present? It is present in the cytosol and mitochondria. So it has two isoenzymes, one of which is a selenium containing metalloenzyme. The other is a non-selenium containing. Why is it important? Selenium acts as an antioxidant. So it catalyzes the reduction of hydrogen peroxide and lipid peroxide by forming reduced glutathione. So to tell it simply, whether it is hydrogen peroxide 
or a lipid peroxide. I am just showing it as a lipid peroxide. Now, both these can be converted to their respective non peroxide forms, maybe water or the non uh, uh, peroxide form of lipid peroxide. But during this conversion, glutathione, which is in the reduced form, GASH, that is how we show it, is converted to two are converted to GS. S G. We say that there is a disulfide bond being formed. I'll just repeat it here again. G S H. What happens? It gives its uh, hydrogen, and two of them combine and form a cysteine cysteine molecule. Cysteine and cysteine combine to form G S S G. This is oxidized glutathione, whereas G S H is the reduced glutathione. So, GSH is oxidized to its oxidized form GSSG. This is involved glutathione peroxidase is involved peroxidase. So, it is involved in the peroxidation of hydrogen peroxide or the lipid peroxide to its respective non-reactive non uh, oxygen species. So, let us go again. What, what will happen once this glutathione which has been oxidized how can this be regenerated so we have another mechanism in the body by which gssg is converted to glutathione back to its reduced form i'll just show you this in separately gssg is converted back to gsh so how is this done this is done with the help of the enzyme glutathione reductase glutathione Reductase. So, what is required for this? For this, you have an important thing that is required and that is NADPH. Glutathione reductase requires NADPH. This is converted to NADP plus. So, from where did this NADPH come? Please remember HMP shunt. So, it came from glucose. Glucose was responsible for the formation of NADPH. NADPH by the action of glutathione reductase converts oxidized GSSG to reduce GSH or glutathione. This is one of the functions of NADPH. So let us go ahead with glutathione reductase is over, glutathione peroxidase, GPX is over which is responsible for uh, removal of Hydrogen peroxide, we have catalyst, we have superoxide dismutase and their dis uh, distribution in the various tissues. So, let me talk a bit more about glutathione which is an important uh, antioxidant. Now, this is the most important, abundant, most abundant intracellular non-protein thiol because thiol why it contains sh group so a non-protein remember glutathione is a tripeptide so a non-protein thiol abundant most abundant within the cell is glutathione it is mainly present in the cytosol and mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum and nucleus so wherever you see glutathione is present endoplasmic reticulum but the concentration is more uh, less in various other parts mainly in the mitochondria and the cytoplasm remember glutathione is very much abundantly present in the rpc especially in the cytosol remember rpcs do not contain nucleus they do not contain mitochondria so in the cytoplasm its concentration is to, uh, very high within the cytoplasm of glutathione and that helps in maintaining the RBC membrane integrity. So, let us look at uh, more about it. It functions as an antioxidant by scavenging free radicals and in detoxification of xenobiotics also. So, the electron donor in the reaction of peroxides catalyzed by glutathione peroxidase and it is converted to GSSG. It is reconverted back by, by glutathione reductase. So, we have two enzymes involved in the metabolism of glutathione. Glutathione peroxidase and glutathione reductase. This is something which should be known to you because the here it is NADPH is there whereas here it is acting as an antioxidant. So, that is important. Now, this finishes our enzymatic antioxidants. Now, let us go further with the vitamin antioxidants, the non-enzymatic ones. Now, 
वन ऑफ द मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टेंट विटामिन एंटी ऑक्सीडेंट इज विटामिन ई इट इज ऑल्सो कॉल्ड एज आल्फा टोकोफेरॉल दिस इज वेरी वाइडली डिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड एंड इट इज अ पोर्टेंट लाइपोफिलिक एंटी ऑक्सीडेंट इट इज प्रेजेंट इन सेल मेमरिंग इट एक्ट एज अ चेन ब्रेकिंग ऑन्टी ऑक्सीडेंट एंड अ फ्री रेडिकल स्कैवेंचर सो लेट इज लुक एट अदर विटामिन एंटी ऑक्सीडेंट एट ऑल्सो इंक्लूड्स बीटा कैरोटीन बीटा कैरोटीन इज अ प्रिकर्सर ऑफ विटामिन ए इट इज प्रेजेंट कैरोटीन मीन्स इट इज प्रेजेंट इन कैरेट्स इट इज हाईली प्रेजेंट इन ऑल द येलो कलर्ड वेजिटेबल्स लाइक इंक्लूडिंग पपाया मैंगो एक्सेट्रा so it is beta carotene is a precursor of vitamin a it is an effective scavenger of alkoxyl and hydroperoxyl radicals vitamin c is another vitamin anti oxidant that is ascorbic acid it works as a cellular aqueous phase antioxidant so vitamin e was lipophilic and present in the lipid phase whereas vitamin c works in the aqueous phase it also reacts directly with superoxide or with hydroxyl ion as well as with lipid hydroperoxide it acts as chain breaking antioxidant by regenerating the reduced form of vitamin e the alpha tocopherol let me just show it to you how it happens so if you look at the action of uh, between vitamin e uh, lipid and the water the aqueous phase how these antioxidants interact with each other so let us look at the cell cytoplasm and you have the cell membrane which is containing phospholipids so what happens now the phospholipids are there most of the time please remember more the unsaturated fatty acid that is present in the cell membrane more is its effect as a free radical more is its chances of getting into lipid peroxidation more the pufa more the lipid peroxidation so unsaturated fatty acids they undergo first thing is they react with some free radical and the radical becomes okay non radical product and oxygen and it gets converted to a peroxy radical polyunsaturated fatty acid lipid peroxide is formed this lipid peroxide is highly reactive and it will undergo chain reaction so what is there this lipid peroxide should be terminated we should terminate this chain reaction so what do we have we have to convert it into its ooh form so what is required is tocopherol this is remember this is still happening in the membrane itself the membrane phospholipids so tocopherol is converted to its radical form but this can be reconverted back to its active form where it can scavenge free radicals by vitamin c vitamin c is present within the cytosol vitamin c is a present in the cytosol will react with tocopherol and uh, this gets uh, converted to its own anti oxidative reduced form and it regenerates vitamin e it could be either even because of glutathione which is doing this and they are regenerated back using nadph so basically we have seen that vitamin e acts as a chain breaking antioxidant vitamin c also can act as a chain breaking antioxidant because of its reaction with vitamin e now we i go on to one concept that is oxidative stress as we saw till now free radicals are being continuously produced at the same time there is a mechanism to prevent this free radicals from acting so we have a, something which is happening in the body one is free radicals other is antioxidants so how what is oxidative stress so in the normal cellular metabolism there is a balance balance is between free radical production and the antioxidants there is normally a balance and so we are all healthy okay so free radical generation and antioxidant production but in sometimes especially in certain clinical conditions it has been found out that the free radical generation is more and the antioxidant capacity is less the antioxidants are not able to scavenge out all these free radicals the result is the free radicals are going to do their damage remember they are highly reactive they can damage the dna they can damage the 
all the proteins they can damage the enzymes they can damage the lipids they can damage bring about cell integrity itself can be damaged so this free radicals have to be scavenged so your antioxidant levels are low and free radicals are high then it can result in a disease and this is because call it as oxidative stress so this imbalance in the pro oxidant or the free radical generation and the antioxidant level is known as oxidative stress. So are there any markers by which we can come to know whether a person is under oxidative stress or not? Free radicals have been implicated in all the diseases. So if you look at it at the cellular level, it is always because of free radicals that something is happening. If you want to look at DNA damage, then also it is because of free radicals. You look at a cancer, free radicals. You look at arthritis, it is free radicals. You look at uh, cardiovascular diseases, free radicals. At the molecular level, it is always because of free radicals, any disease process is occurring. So let us look at the markers for oxidative stress. Are there any markers? One, we can have something which is damaged, which is released, which we can mark. Or we can look at certain antioxidant levels itself within the blood. So which are the markers? Now one important marker is malon dialdehyde, which is a marker for lipid peroxidation. Though this is something which is not being used in routine clinical practices, research is going on whether to include this or not in different clinical lab settings. Maybe it may not be necessary because we all know that at the molecular level it is because of free radical generation and because of lipid peroxidation that a disease is occurring. So malondialdehyde is a marker for lipid peroxidation. We have oxo DG what called as deoxygonosine 8 hydro oxyl 2 prime deoxygonosine which is a marker for DNA damage again from an MCQ point of view I am talking about all this the protein carbonyl content is the marker for protein oxidation glutathione redox ratio whether GSSG is more or GSH is more the glutathione redox ratio is a measure of cellular redox state let us look at the clinical significance of different oxidative stresses and how they will help. We will look at atherosclerosis. As I have told to you before, atherosclerosis is mainly because of low density lipoprotein which is the bad cholesterol. Now LDL, can it always lead to bad things? No. This LDL is a lipoprotein. Remember, this lipoprotein is just to carry cholesterol. Now this lipoprotein, if it undergoes some damage only then the macrophages will think it to be foreign and engulf it and then it becomes bad. So what are the factors which cause a change in LDL which we call as oxidized LDL. So oxidized LDL has come because of action of oxidants. So LDL are deposited under the endothelial cell and they undergo oxidized LDL by free radicals and that attracts the macrophages and macrophages engulf this oxidized LDL and they get converted to foam cells. There is one uh, disease known as chronic granulomatous disease. What is this disease? Remember in the phagolysosome for the initial formation of superoxide in this we require NADPH oxidase. NADPH can reacts with oxygen to form superoxide. Now this is something which is necessary within the body. This is something which is necessary for the killing of a bacteria. Suppose superoxide was not formed. What would happen? Now what is that? That is known as chronic granulomatous disease. So in these people NADPH oxidase is absent and what will happen? Uh, where is it absent? In the macrophages and neutrophils. So it leads to defective phagocytic function and what is one more thing is happening is the bacteria are engulfed and they form a granuloma. They are not getting degraded because there is no superoxide, there is no hydrogen peroxide, there is no hypochlorous acid to bring about the lysis of the bacteria. So what will happen? There is this bacteria will remain within these WBCs or within this neutrophils and it will form a granuloma and slowly that is why the condition is known as chronic granulomatous disease. It leads to uh, they are also susceptible to uh, different microbial and fungal infections depending upon it is a catalyst positive uh, uh, action or not chronic 
granulomatous disease you will learn more about this in the later years so right now just remember that it is nadph oxidase that is deficient so we go further one important area that is role in aging free radicals play a very important role in aging and they are involved in neurodegenerative disorders like parkinsons alzheimers dementia multiple sclerosis in all these conditions there may be other things which may be involved the genetic levels or something else maybe uh, maybe some other reason maybe there some other protein misfolding may be happening but all that is attributed because of increase in free radicals so in many of these diseases it is they give antioxidants or they give fruits and vegetables which are rich in beta carotene vitamin c etc so that is the reason why we have to take all these fruits and vegetables to increase the antioxidant levels within our body now i look at the carcinogenesis and treatment yes free radicals mediate dna damage that leads to mutation and finally malignancy free radicals are also involved in chronic and acute inflammation ischemia reperfusion injury and anything and everything free radicals have been implicated so with this we come to the end of free radicals and the different antioxidants and their role in health and their role in disease thank you